This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. Hello and welcome. In just a few days, Parliament will finally vote on Gujarat. But in the state, every day still unfolds an untold horror. One of the most invisible stories so far, perhaps, has been the impact the violence has had on women and children, till several fact-finding missions released some extremely disturbing testimonies. We have travelled back to Gujarat with a member of one such fact-finding mission to chronicle how women and children in the state are fighting back. Our journey begins the same way as all our previous visits, on the highway between Vadodara and Godra. Two months later, the staff is back at the toll booths. The roads have been freshly tarred, and shops that we had seen reduced to ashes have sprung up again and are back at business. But in our car, the mood is grim. Our colleague for the day, activist Farah Nakvi, is telling us about the tragedies she chronicled just a few weeks ago. 30 minutes later, we enter Halol, once the state's main industrial belt. Today, the entire township has become a relief camp. The community has thrown open its homes to kith and kin, and sometimes even perfect strangers, who have all come here looking for refuge. Up a dark winding staircase is our first stop. A group of women are huddled together, clutching their babies as if they may be the next to go. Zubeda and her daughter-in-law got separated from the rest of their family while fleeing the mob. Two months on, her husband is missing. He was a tailor who lived in Dubai and was on vacation when the violence began. And this is only one part of her story. Seven others from Zubeda's family are also missing. The only bodies that were recovered were those of her parents. Her father, a school teacher, was one of the last to leave the village, since he believed he would never be harmed. For now, Zubeda's family eats at the community kitchen. But what next? Since she has no proof of her husband's death, she isn't even entitled to basic compensation. In fact, in the Godra Panchmahel district, only 88 people have been certified as dead. Over 60 have received their compensation packages. But consider this, 240 others are branded missing. Aid workers argue that Gujarat's violence left bodies charred and impossible to identify. The rules make no sense, they say. The missing must be taken as dead. While the IPC provides that about uh, if a person is missing for seven years, that is when you can probably perhaps come to the conclusion that he's no more. We are planning to refer this matter to the government because it is a policy issue. I mean, under these circumstances, if we need to... Uh, take a different course of ac action. First of all, we're collecting the data, and based on it, we'd make a sub submission to the state government. And uh, as soon as we get some guidelines from there, we'll implement it. For now, at least, these women and children are assured of two meals a day and a roof over their head. But in the days and months to come, this will be the real crisis. The creation of scores of female-headed households, women who have lost their fathers, their brothers, their sons, and their husbands, and in effect, the earning members of their households. As lunch is served, women and children gather under a blazing sun. We've rarely met such quiet children, children who seem numbed by the brutality they have had to witness. The only time 12-year-old Ayub Pathan breaks into a soft smile 
is when he writes his name for us in Gujarati. His mother says for the past two months, he's barely spoken. On the 28th of February, when a mob chased down his family, Ayub and his four cousins, even younger than him, took shelter behind tall bushes. From there, Ayub says he watched his sister and ten cousins being stripped and thrown into a canal. Ayub was the one who broke the news to his mother, Hasina. What Justice for this family rests entirely on the child's testimony. The police has already recorded Ayub's statement several times, but two months on, no FIR has been registered for either rape or murder. One of the most frightening things that has emerged from the accounts here is the fact that in many incidents of violence and sexual abuse, children were the only eyewitnesses, in some cases no older than eight or nine years. It seems cruel to imagine these children now recounting those horrors, but activists here are saying that the option may be just as bad. Silence could mean children living through a private, internal hell. Do we stand on ethics and say we can't record these children's testimony? They are the only living witnesses if an entire family has died. They, they are living witnesses and we need to record their testimonies. We need to, however, record them with trauma counsellors and we need to make sure that these children are not a permanently damaged generation. Counsellors are needed in these camps almost as urgently as food and water, especially since a child may not even understand what he has had to see. A nine-year-old girl telling me the meaning of rape to her, she doesn't know what happens in the interim between the stripping and the burning, but these are the two things that will permanently scar her mind. And, and this is what these children are, are having to live with. We need trauma counsellors to deal with these kind of cases. We accompany Ayub and Hasina's family members to the police station 25 kilometers away. This will be their 10th attempt to record an FIR. At first, we keep our camera crew outside the station, so the police is unaware of our presence. And minutes later, it's clear that this too has been a fruitless visit. 12-year-old Ayub has now been asked to come to the police station himself to testify in person. But his family is not ready to put an already traumatized child through this. What is their trust? What do we do with our children? What do we do with our children? We can't give anyone's trust. Is that right?